Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship Online. We are so glad that you are here, and we hope that this message encourages you today. To find more information about our church or future events, go to tbfonline.net. You know, I would tell you that um, anytime in my past or anytime in my present, when I have gotten trouble in my past or trouble in my present, it was because of my inability to listen to someone. And usually the choice that I made later was because of the first choice of my inability to listen. We have just come off uh, the, talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection And how many times Jesus told his disciples what was going to happen, and they never did hear it. They never listened. And it's real easy for us to look at that and go, how did they miss this? I mean, he kept telling them over and over and over that he was going to die, he was going to raise again, but nobody ever got it. But I think it's real easy for us to make those kind of comments about how come they didn't listen when we've been able to see Uh, two facts, and that was the crucifixion and the resurrection. The disciples didn't have that privilege. The crucifixion and the resurrection hadn't happened yet. But you think about how many times that God continues to say to us something for our benefit, and yet we look at it, and a lot of times we don't listen to what God says. And so let's not forget that when Jesus begins this movement that he, he began, this is a really a new thing that's going on. So if you got your Bibles, we're going to be back in Luke, Luke chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 31. I'll get there in just a second. But at this point, Jesus is, um, he, he is he's doing his message, his message and his ministry. It begins in Galilee, and now it's in a place called Capernaum, which becomes the headquarters for his ministry. So we're going to look at several verses, starting with verse 31 of chapter 4 of Luke. Would you stand with me as we honor Scripture this morning? Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue, there was, a, there was a man possessed by a demon, and in pure spirit, he cried out at the top of his voice, Go away. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are. With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So the question that we all need to ask ourselves today is, how important are the words of Jesus to us? Now, I will tell you this. If Of all the things that I pray for for our church, if you were asked me, what's the one constant thing that you would pray for? This is the one constant thing. And that is, if you call yourself a Christ follower and you are attending the Bridge Fellowship, that you would learn how to hear the voice of God. That would be the cry of my heart this morning. And I pray today, that with things that we talk about, that you'll walk out and you'll know, okay, I'm, this is where I need to be going, and I'm going to put myself in position to hear God's voice. Pray with me, would you? God, thank you for today, and I pray today, God, that you allow us to learn some things. I pray, God, that we'll see from the text the importance of Jesus, of who you are, and the, and the importance of hearing your voice to us. So, God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So, three reasons of why the voice of God should be the most important. Here's the first reason, is that he is our voice of authority. How many times do we hear somebody say, hey, you better listen to them. They know what they're saying. Or you think about how many times even the disciples heard about the crucifixion and the resurrection. They didn't hear it. But here's what we know. You and I know about the crucifixion. We know about the resurrection. So the question again is, okay, how important is it for us to hear the voice of of truth as authority in our life. Now, the region where Jesus was teaching was a very populated place. 
The region alone had more than 2 million people at the time, many more than there are there today. But the synagogue was built by the Romans. So we'll eventually get to Luke chapter 7, but when we finally get there, you're going to see a story about a Roman centurion, a Roman soldier, and he comes to Jesus because one of his servants is sick, and he asks Jesus to heal him. Most theologians will say in, in, in Luke 7, it is that Roman centurion that built the synagogue where Jesus is teaching here. And so Jesus is teaching. He's teaching the synagogue. Now, go back to verse 31 in your text. It says that they were amazed. I will tell you, to circle that word amazed right out in the margin of your Bible. Again, let me tell you, it's reason it's important to bring a hard copy of the Word of God with you so that you can write some things down and go back and know what it, what it means, what it says. But it says, they were amazed. It means greatly astonished. It means overwhelmed by his teaching. And then it says, his message had authority. Circle the word authority. Put out in the, mar in the, in the margins of your Bible. It means unpeated unimpeded power to act. In other words, rightfully possessed. So this person by the name of Jesus, he has authority when he teaches, but also they were amazed at what he says. Now, the reason they were amazed was the rabbis would get up and they would teach in the church, in the temple. And they would just simply get up, they would teach, and then when they get to point, they would never give application. They would just say, so and so, another rabbi, another famous rabbi, and then they would quote another rabbi. Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, but I say. Now, the, the reason that he says, but I say, is that he gives application to the text that he's talking about. He says this in his application. And you think about it, when someone would come to us and they would ask our opinion, we probably need to ask, okay, where does our opinion come from? I mean, is it just our opinion? Because if somebody asks your opinion, it really would be better to say, you know what? It really doesn't even matter what my opinion is at all. But it does matter what the opinion of God is. Because the opinion of God is truth itself. Because it matters greatly what God's opinion is. So while he's teaching, think about this. He's in church. He's in the temple. And when he, when he is teaching, there is a demon-possessed man that comes in. Now, the demon-possessed man, he comes in to interrupt the teaching of Christ and look at the voice of authority. Jesus never addresses the demon-possessed man. He addresses the demons themselves. Look at verse 33 and 34 with me. It says, in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, you talking about news flash, you think about what happens around, around town when there is a demon-possessed man that shows up at church. And then Jesus heals this demon-possessed man. You see, the demons know who Jesus is because he is the voice of authority. Now, he is a voice of authority because of who he is. Now, when you go back to verse 34, if we can go back to verse 34, it says, uh, have you come to this choice? I know who you are. I'll tell you, circle that word are. The reason that you need to circle that word are, okay, it, it means it possesses a trait that no one else possesses. So let's go back and see if we can look at some things about this person of who Jesus is, all right? Let's start back at the very beginning in Genesis 1-1 when God creates the world, all right? So Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you might not be in Genesis 1-1, but that word right there, that God, okay, that word God is not a singular God. It's a plural God. It's Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. It means a plural God. So when God created when God created the world, it wasn't just God. It was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. All three of them had something to do with creation. So we know that Jesus is there, and he is at creation. Now, when you look at God the Father, God the Father is not any more God than, than God the Son, Jesus, or God the Holy Spirit. They're all three equal God. They all just have different personalities. They all have different 
things that they do. So in the beginning, God. Now, let's go over to Colossians chapter 1. And it says this. The Son, that's speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created, all things have been created through him and for him. So understand this, God is the architect of all the world. It was God's idea to create everything that he created, but he put Jesus in charge with all of his creative juices, with all of his creative power. He's the one that created everything. Do you understand that? You got to know that, all right? It is Jesus that is a part of this creation. So that's the reason that the voice of authority, when Jesus is speaking, the demons know who he is because Jesus has been around forever, just like God himself and God the Spirit. So let's go to John 1. And see what it says. The Apostle John writes about Jesus. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, this is what it's saying. They said, Jesus is just not the Son of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. So, we, a lot of people go, well, I, I don't know. I, nobody really has ever seen God. Oh, they have seen God. It's in the person of Christ. So, how does God, how would God act on earth? Just like Jesus did. Exactly. So in the beginning was the Word. He was with God in the beginning. There you go again. Back to Genesis 1.1. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So understand that Jesus, God is the architect. Jesus is the one that is building the house. He's the one that made sure that everything was done. So when it comes to the, to the part in Scripture here where the where the demons are, and the demons show up at church, and they're in this man. You see, the demons understood who Jesus was. Now, there are two other places that we see the authority of the voice of God. In verses 38 and 39, it says, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. Now, in Scripture, there's usually two kind of fevers that are talked about. It's a low-grade fever and a high-grade fever. The high-grade fever is what would kill a person. So here she is. She's got, she has a high-grade fever. Suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. Again, the authority of the voice. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up and went and began to wait on him. So here he is, and he goes. There's not Advil. There's not Tylenol around. It is just Dr. Jesus shows up in the house and speaks to the healing, and she is healed immediately. And let me tell you, Jesus can still do that today. He can still heal. Sometimes he chooses to. Sometimes he chooses not to do that. But he does this because of the authority of his voice. Now, there's a third time we see the authority of his voice. So, What's happened? They've had church. He has taught. He has taught to everybody. Everybody was amazed. And then the demon-possessed man shows up. He frees this guy of being demon-possessed. Then he goes to Peter's house. Peter's mother-in-law is there. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. That's a full day of ministry, folks. All right? That's not all of it. And then guess what happens? All of the town shows up with all of their sick friends, and family. And then, because news has traveled, I don't know what they're doing. I, I'm assuming that probably after he, after he heals Peter's mother-in-law, I don't know if they got out on the front lawn and play cornhole or sit by the fire pit. Everybody's got a fire pit, so I don't know if that's what he's doing. He's doing something. And then all the sick people of the region show up, but not only that, people that are demon-possessed, they show up as well. Look at the next verse here. As in verse 40 and 41. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. So everybody that showed up, he healed all of them. And then, moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. So, when you see that, when you see that, that, they, that uh, he said he, he rebuked him and we'd not allow them to speak. Why, why is he not letting them speak? Well, see, the reason he's not letting them speak is because he, 
he didn't, he didn't want the demons to push the timeline to, to, to show everybody who he was because that would not happen until the cross. Now, when we look at this, there's two different times that demons are talked about. So I want to go back and I want us to just talk about the principle of warfare here. So when we look at the principle of warfare, is that when God created everything, he created angels as well. When he created angels, his most cherished creation as an angel was one by the name of Lucifer. He was in heaven, but he decided that he was going to rebel against the authority of God. And so when he tried to rebel, pride gets him kicked out of heaven. When he got kicked out of heaven, Isaiah 14 is a reference for you there, is that he got kicked out of heaven. It says a third of the angels went with him. That's what we know of as demons today. So when we struggle, a lot of times we just say, you know what, the devil's after me. Really, the devil's not after you because the devil is just a hierarchy. He He's the one in charge. The demons do all the bidding. The demons do what Satan tells them to do. Now, remember, they have to go before the throne of God, and God has to give them permission. But he will use demonic spirits in our life when we choose to live in disobedience to the will of God. And so it is demons that are always attacking us. But look at the three principles of warfare that I want you to see. The first principle of warfare is, is that they knew his power. They knew that Jesus was God in the flesh, the same power that God possessed. And they remember God's voice kicking them out of heaven, and they became demons. Jesus has the same power as God. They knew who Jesus was. They also knew that Jesus had the power to destroy them if he wanted to. So the first thing was they knew his power. Secondly, they knew his voice. When Jesus told them, go back to verse 35 in your text. When Jesus told them to be quiet, the literal rendering in the language is, I would tell you to circle that word, be quiet, put it out in the margin of your Bible, shut up. That's what he said to him, shut up. Now, when he says that, the picture in the language is when you take a muzzle and put it on a dog and a dog cannot bark. So he says to them, be quiet. He muzzles them. The demons knew what they would know today that he had authority over them for two reasons. Number one, because of who Jesus was, because of his character, and number two, because of his voice. But the third thing that we see that the demons do, they did then, they do now. They attempt to confuse. Jesus would not allow the demons to speak because he knew their desire was to confuse the people to push the timetable of when Jesus would reveal who he was. And Jesus knew that was not going to happen until the cross. But also, Jesus wanted the people to believe that he was a Messiah because of his words and not the words of the demons themselves. God wants to know who, God wants us to know who he is because of his voice of authority. And you see, when we see this, is that it's real easy to look. And I mean, you think about it, you're in church today, and all of a sudden somebody shows up, this demon possessed. That's usually all you're going to talk about. That's not the most supernatural thing. We think, oh, that, demon would, that, that, that Jesus would cast out a demon. That's the most supernatural thing. That is a supernatural thing. But that's not the most supernatural thing. The most supernatural thing that could ever happen, you've heard me say this before, I want to say it again to you, is when the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell in our life and the Holy Spirit allows us to be able to interpret the voice of authority, the Word of God, so that we can understand it, so that we can know the authority of God's voice in our life. That's the most supernatural thing that could happen. So the demons will do all they can so we don't hear the authority of God's voice. And so when we don't hear his voice, confusion is what happens. I want to encourage you to take a picture of this, write it down, but the demons will do everything to distract us from the authority of God's voice resulting in confusion. Let me say that again. The demons will do everything to distract us from the authority of God's voice resulting in confusion. He'll always attempt to do that. You think how he does everything that he can to make sure that we don't hear God's voice in our life. So now, the first reason we talk about the voice of authority, that's really the theological part, okay? And that's really important. Now, the second and third point really are the application points. So here's the second reason, is that he is our rest. I would say that this reason is the one that Christ's followers avoid the most. 
me included. Because, see, we don't give ourselves space of time to be alone with God. Man, I get it. Some of you are incredibly busy. You return emails. You're trying to meet deadlines. You've got to meet quotas. I get all that. Some of you who have multiple kids or, or just one kid, you're just going, my gosh, it's so busy and I just can't have any time. Okay, so here's a question, though. If Jesus is God in the flesh and it was so important for him to be alone with the Father, how much more important would that be for you and I? So look what it says in verse 42. And if you're not careful, when you read the text, you'll just skip over it. And it says, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Some translations say an isolated place. I love how the message translates it. An open country. I just think, think just fields. Just, you, you, you don't see anything but just fields and fields and fields. And you are meeting in that space alone with God. It's a secluded place. But the point is, is that Jesus was alone with the Father. Now, why was he alone with the Father? Well, we've seen is that, man, he has been through some some, some tough times. I mean, he's, he's healed people. He's, he's cast demons out of people. He's healed even more people. So you think about why would he need to be alone with the Father? So that he would have time just to have rest and have, and have stillness and to steal his soul before God. So let me ask you, are you putting yourself in position just to have rest before God? Because right now in your life, You've got some trauma. You've got some storms. I'll share at the end of the service about a storm that Sharon and I have that a lot of people are having right now. But can I just tell you that in mine and my wife's deepest, darkest, depressing times of our life, and we really went through it together, is that the thing that we continue to see is that no matter what, you still better make time just to be alone with the Father and to hear the authority of his voice. It will keep you going when nothing else does. So how do we do this? How do we steal our soul before God? So let me give you this, all right? So you take your picture, you write it down, whatever you want to do, but okay, here's what I want you to do. So you, you decide, okay, I, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to spend time alone with God because that's real important to me, to hear God's voice in my life. So here, here's what you got, okay? The first thing you do, I would tell you, get up. I would tell you to always try to do it in the morning. Now, I know that might be difficult, but notch out time somewhere where you can just be alone with God. The first thing I would tell you to do is to put your, put your earbuds in and listen to a worship song and just get your heart ready to hear God's voice, but also that you pray. And when you pray, is that you're asking the Holy Spirit of God to speak truth to you through the Word of God. Now, you might already be a step ahead of me, and you might be saying, well, that's just it. I really was never raised in church. I don't have any kind of really religious background in my life. And matter of fact, you know what? I, I didn't make really, I, 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 did, I, I didn't do really good on the ACT test. I've got great news for you today from one who did very poorly on the ACT test, all right? It has nothing to do with your academic excellence. It has nothing to do with even what you already know. It has to do with that you're allowing the Spirit of God to reveal truth to you through the Word of God. So if you're a Christ follower and the Holy Spirit lives in you, you got everything that you need to understand what God wants to say to you through the Word of God. Could I get an amen on that? So pray and ask the Spirit of God to reveal truth, right? So here you go, all right? Here's what I'm gonna do. First thing, Make sure that you're reading Scripture, okay? It's an acrostic of the word soap that you'll see in a minute. But first of all, it's Scripture. So you're taking Scripture and you're reading Scripture. Okay, go to the Bible app. There are so many different kind of places you can go, but make sure that you're reading Scripture. You've prayed, you've asked God to reveal truth to you. Make sure that you're reading Scripture. Don't walk away from that. And you've heard me say it before, so I don't disappoint you. Journal what God teaches you. Write it down. You learn more when... When you're writing it down. I know you might, especially men, we're the worst. Oh, I don't write anything down. You would if it's important enough to you. I promise you. If it's a million dollar deal, I promise you you're going to write some stuff down. The king of the universe is looking to talk to you. All right? Write it down. So read scripture. Second thing is observe. So here's what you're doing when you're observing the text. And I will just tell you, I read anywhere from about 
10 to 15 verses a day. Because of my ADD, if I get more than 20, I mean, I'm everywhere. I'm all over the map. I'm, do, I'm, I'm cleaning the house, and they, I'm not even supposed to be cleaning the house, all right? I get so messed up. And so, for some of you that can do that, that's great. Maybe if I'm in the Old Testament or the book of Psalms, I might read more than 20 verses, but very seldom. I'm reading 10 to 15 verses, and the, the, the observation is, what does the Scripture say? Again, I'm journaling some things. I'm just putting a few lines down. Okay, the A is this, is that the A is to apply. So observe is, what does it say? What's the scripture say? The application, the apply part, what does it say to me? How does it apply to me? Oh my gosh, I don't even, you might say, I don't even understand scripture. Just start. You'll be amazed of how the Spirit of God will come and just usher truth into your life. So apply what it says, okay? And the last thing is prayer. God, give me strength to apply what you've taught me and continue to go back to it to the day. And so I'll tell you, I promise you this works. It's a system that I've used for years and years, all right? But let me tell you, go back. In our darkest days, I promise you, he still wants to, he still wants to speak to our soul and he wants your soul to have rest so that you can trust him even in the midst of difficult times in our lives. The third reason is this, is that he transforms us. You talk about the transformation process. Yes, the Bible is a historical book. Yes, it has history in it. It's got a lot of history in it. But what you have to understand is that the reason that the Bible is written is to transform our lives because the the priority of God, of God, God speaking the word of God is that it's about transformation. It's always been about transformation. Look what it says in verse 42 through 44 here. It says, the people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, if you've got your Bible, circle that word, that phrase, kingdom of God. That's a word that will continue to come up in the book of Luke. It will come up over and over and over again. Now, when you talk about what does that word, what does a kingdom of God means, okay? It is the rule of someone. So we talk about the kingdom of God. It is the rule of God. And so he talks about the kingdom of God. And he also says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So What we're doing is that we're allowing the Word of God to preach to us, to speak to us, to transform our lives. No matter where you are, God is wanting to impart truth to our lives so that we understand. He talks about the preaching of the kingdom of God. That is where it all started because the prophets in the Old Testament, they kept talking about this one by the name of Jesus, the Messiah that was coming, the Emmanuel, God with us. And so, We celebrated Christmas. Mary gives birth to a baby by the name of Jesus. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is coming. Now the kingdom of God has shown up. And then we see the life of the kingdom of God. How we act by looking at Jesus and how he acts in the four gospels. And then all through the epistles. And then that Jesus is going to come back. Everything that is written in scripture from the Old Testament to the end of the New Testament is about a love story of Jesus coming that Jesus showed up and he is about transforming our lives so when you think about this this Jesus that showed up this kingdom of God that showed up in our life think about this he said when they put the crown of thorns on his head he was the one that made the bush the crowns came from when they took the nails and put them through his hands and his feet he's the one that produced the material for the metal to go through through his body when he was put up on a tree it was Jesus that spoke the tree into existence that he would die for it is about a love story it's about Jesus Emmanuel God with us coming to dwell in us and the spirit of God would be us for the church to be formed and now the spirit of God lives in you so that you and I could live out the kingdom of God now the kingdom of God when does that happen when the spirit of God comes to indwell in us and see what happens though is I'm afraid is that you've heard me say this I want to say it again to all of us is that we see a demon possessed individual 
just be freed. And we, and we think, oh my gosh, that's incredible. That is incredible. And the fact that Jesus can heal somebody, <clears throat> that's incredible. But here's what we do. We get so caught up in the supernatural. See, we get so caught up in the deliverance of a demon-possessed person. And I think that we all would say today, we all want freedom and we all want rest. Rest for our souls that we don't worry that we give things to God. That's what we all want. But you see, there is a difference between deliverance and freedom. Deliverance gives you the opportunity to have freedom. And the price for freedom is that we would take responsibility. And our responsibility is to desire transformation. Transformation only happens when we are hearing and obeying the authority of God's voice in our life. You might be the person here today and in your life, you're that kind of person that you really never worry. <clears throat> I, I really wish that I was more like you. I'm not. I, I want to be more like that. And God continues to do some things in me, but maybe you're that person, you just never worry. You never worry about anything. That's your personality. Or maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum that you worry about everything. You, I mean, you get up, first thing you do is worry. Or maybe you're somewhere in the between, in, in between of worrying all the time or not worrying at all. No matter where you are on that scale, if you are basing everything on your personality, there will never be transformation in your life. Transformation happens when we are putting ourselves in position to hear the voice of authority in our life. So are we going to do that? So you walk out here today. you got an opportunity to start today. You can start today. Go to the Bible app. Go figure out what you can do. Buy a journal. They're, they're at Pop Shelf, they're five bucks. Go buy one, all right? Buy one for your spouse as well. And just tell them, Pastor Phil said you needed this. All right, start writing in it, all right? So are we going to hear the, the voice of God? Put yourself in position. But all this starts, it has a beginning point. You have to give your life to Jesus. If that doesn't happen, you, you're not going to hear God's voice. It's the greatest privilege you have is to hear God's voice, to hear the authority of his voice. But it starts with your relationship with Christ. So <clears throat> ask yourself a question, have I really made that decision? Have I made a decision to give my life to Christ as that happened? So can I ask you right now, would you bow your heads and close your eyes?